backyard, you know, below the trees in the national airspace? Yes, basically. The, the, I'm not a lawyer, and I, you know, I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so, uh, but it has been explained to me numerous times by the lawyers that the, the navigable airspace is defined by where aircraft can safely navigate. So, uh, for example, a uh, evacuation helicopter, a medical helicopter, uh, can land in front of your house on the street to pick you up and take you to the, to the hospital. So therefore, that area is part of the navigable airspace. Uh, it does go to the ground. Uh, typically, uh, you don't see a lot of control by the FAA in the lower altitudes. It's really left up to uh, this fundamental principle that is sort of the underlying basis for all of our rules of the air. It's called see and avoid. A pilot must remain vigilant in visual conditions to see and avoid other aircraft and to remain well clear. I think that's pretty close to a direct quote of what the rule says. Unmanned aircraft can't do that because you, you can't see uh, the other aircraft. You're not there in the aircraft. Uh, and I know a lot of people believe, well, the video stream coming down you know, gives me that capability. But unfortunately, the, the law is very clear that that's an instrument, not your eyeballs. So you can't comply with the rule with a, an instrument and, and without some uh, approval from the FAA that that instrument provides an equivalent level of safety to the Mark I eyeballs looking out of the So the, the reason it's so challenging to integrate unmanned aircraft is that fundamental difference uh, in the way the aircraft is operated is contrary to one of the fundamental precepts of how we run the national airspace system. So, uh, that's why, yes, it does go down to the ground in your backyard because it's navigable by an aircraft. And uh, so sort of the, the way I look at it is that by virtue of creating an unmanned aircraft that can operate in that space, you've sort of expanded the definition of what the navigable airspace is. But this space is also by the earth now. So, uh, and they are uh, in, the, in, the, in the regulation, Pilot of the helicopter is responsible of uh, seeing the helicopter. So if the drone uh, is compared to, uh, I mean, this is uh, as dangerous as the bird, and, uh, and uh, uh, will it uh, solve the problem? Well, no one has presented the data to me yet, and, and we haven't had the resources to do the research to determine uh, what is the, it is a small unmanned aircraft equivalent to a bird. Uh, in that type of situation that you described. Uh, it's, it's one of the research areas that we're hoping to solve over the next few years so that we could draw that parallel. So, I mean, is that kind of the single biggest challenge facing right now, trying to come up with the eventual goal? I think it's, like, it's like kind of fitting. Dealing with a new type of aircraft, Jim? I mean, what is the single biggest hurdle, if there is one, or if there are any, feel free to eliminate them for us. But, um, What's kind of the single biggest block right now trying to get the rule? I mean, the, the rule is going to come out soon. Uh, there's no single issue with it. It's just the process that we've got to go through. There's no real barriers for that. It's just a matter of, of cranking it through the process. Uh, there, if, there are a lot of things that need to be resolved in this space. The FAA's approach is going to be incremental. We're going to make sure that each step we take is measured and carefully thought out so that we don't reduce the safety of, of what is the safest means of transportation in the world. And, um, and let me just make a comment on that, just talk about the safety case, is, is again, from our state perspective, we, we desperately want and desire this industry to grow. Desperately. I mean, and, and, and we, we want all of you and your interests, you know, basically, to become successful and, and, and develop you know, disruptive technologies, game changers. Um, but also conversely, when you talk about the safety case, understand that from a public perspective, public perspective, there there's there's many people out there that look at this technology that basically cast it aside of its lanes to say, you know, we don't get it or we're we're uncomfortable with it. We don't know what it means. Um, and, and unfortunately all you need is one um, I'll just say operator who is careless 
that happens to do something that you know basically crashes it in out to a school bus or you know some type of some type of event that's, that's really negative, and all of a sudden from from I think a state perspective, you're going to get a lot of that public all of a sudden backlash against this industry, and none of us, I, I certainly, and nobody in, in, in the organization I'm in wants that to happen. We, we want to see this grow uh, uh, very robust. So, um, for the folks, it, this, this is kind of what I'd like to get to particularly uh, the closest ones here. What does the rule, or what would you like to see the eventual rule of like that's going to allow drones to grow and for you to be as successful as possible in your business? What does it mean to look like? What would you like it if you were able to make that call? <laughs> I mean, I think it, clarity um, is, is number one, just knowing what the rules are. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ambiguous definitions and things like commercial, build-up areas, populated areas, et cetera. You know, innovators always just tell us what the rules are and what we're around them. And then on top of that, I, you know, I, I would like a de minimis category. Um, and I, again, I'm almost, I'm almost uh, agnostic as to what the boundaries are, but a de minimis category where, Matt, where, where the regulatory barriers are the, light, are the lowest, and that's where all the innovation we will tell us what the rules are, and we will, and we will come up with a good solution. In France, uh, there is a already regulation, and uh, this regulation, uh, I think, uh, is working quite well. And uh, basically, uh, since it doesn't exist, they have defined uh, categories, and uh, three categories. Uh, and uh, there are today uh, 800 uh, companies uh, operating drones uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, in other countries like Switzerland, etc., it's also um, very much allowed. So um, to categorize and to, to make it clear, uh, uh, and uh, another thing, the, 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 the industry, the technology is, uh, is going uh, very quickly, so we'll be able to add uh, on the future, a lot of features uh, on, the, on the drones themselves. Maybe uh, transponders uh, if, uh, if it's needed, or uh, vision to to, to make uh, a noise, uh, like uh, an automatic car. The same, uh, uh, the same question, like, uh, is it allowed to, to, uh, to drive the car, or is that a driver? Um, if the rules are clear for the car, uh, we'll be happy to apply the same rules to, to the road. And uh, I think the, the, the level of uh, dangerosity is, is quite similar. Yeah, and I'll go back to Chris's comments because I kind of echo his and, and that simplicity, clarity is key. Um, there's a lot of uh, issues or, or definitions that, that are clearly defined within the, the, the rules and regulations we operate under the 333 exemption. But again, it's just over time, I think those will be cleared up. Uh, and I'm going to go back to my point about the private pilot's license in terms of what we fly. Right now, we fly anything uh, that's called an SUA, a small and manned aero system up to 55 pounds. Well, some of the products that, that Chris's company and your company develop, obviously, probably we're not going to require a pilot's license. So the, the categories that Chris brought up is going to be key. And what does that look like? And how do you match that with simplicity? Because that's not simple. But how do you make a, a zero to five pound or a zero to ten pound you know, drone category and a ten to twenty? It's complicated because each of those categories are going to have different parameters in which you can operate. So that's, again, a lot of simplicity there. Yeah. So I guess when we're talking about, there's been some touch about drones being able to talk to each other. Is that something that um, is going to be on the government to do? To kind of come up with a system that allows, you know, set, set whether it's a requirement, transponder or something, to have all the drones be on the same page? Is that something that a private consortium can do? What seems like, if, if there is one, a better solution, or do you expect would be the most successful way to go? Well, I, I can give you a description of the, the regulatory structure. Uh, currently, if you operate within certain segments of the airspace, normally the busier airports and above 10,000 feet, you're required to carry either automatic dependent surveillance broadcast or a transponder uh, in order to be able to be seen by air traffic control and to be able to interact with air traffic control. Outside of that, uh, we depend on the C and avoid system. At this point, those rules are rules, and we expect the unmanned aircraft that operate in those environments to meet those rules. And the, and the military and other government aircraft that operate in those airspaces carry transponders. They have radios on board. They can 
talk to air traffic control. Pilots interact with air traffic control just like any other uh, pilot would operating in the national airspace system. I mean, as we speak, there's aircraft flying on, on both borders uh, within the national airspace system working with air traffic control. So to a certain extent, you know, that is already required of unmanned aircraft. That, uh, so that ADSB uh, uh, transponder technology that Jim was mentioning, um, we're already experimenting with uh, implementing that in our drones through a virtual ADSB. So our drones are already connected to the internet uh, via their, their, their telemetry training ground stations. And then we can then inject that ADS, that position data, into the FAA or, or third party database to, to put them you know, on, on, on the radar, if you will, and to receive the data from that database from what else is out there. So, so even, even though we're not required uh, to, we're already uh, putting in place the necessary technology for us to be ready um, and to provide ADSB data when the FAA allows us to do that. And speaking of air traffic control, I know that there is currently the next gen system in the works. Jim, can you talk any bit about how drones are gonna fit into that system? Right, we, uh, there's a couple of specific examples and then there's some general work that's ongoing. Uh, first, the, the FAA is in the process of over the next 10 years replacing the communication system that allows their traffic controllers to talk to pilots. Uh, that system has a requirement to allow a direct connection between the controller and the pilot uh, using the ground-to-ground -ground connection. Currently, the military and other government pilots that operate in the uh, air traffic system speak to the air traffic controller through a satellite link. So, in other words, the voice of the pilot goes through a ground network to a satellite uplink, to a satellite, back to the aircraft, and then the aircraft has a radio on board that talks to the FAA radio on the ground, which then transmits the information to the controller. Obviously, that's a long circuitous route since both of them are on the ground. It seems, makes a lot more sense to connect them on the ground. It also eliminates the delays, etc. So, long term, that's the objective: is to try to you know facilitate those aircraft operating in the national airspace system to be able to connect uh, directly. Because after all, in this day of routed digital communications, uh, that's not really that hard of a task to connect them. Uh, longer term, the automation systems that the FAA uses to manage all air traffic uh, need to deal with some of the uniqueness of unmanned aircraft as they begin to be integrated. Uh, we have a process ongoing by which we're establishing those requirements that will get rolled into the future releases of the automation, uh, the software that we use to manage the air traffic system. Uh, all of that is part of the next generation of air traffic control system. So is the I mean, Chris, over the time. But uh, do you think um, uh, to operate uh, a drone in the future, uh, uh, a transponder, and uh, to have, a, I mean, a large drone, not a very small one, uh, and a transponder and a, a phone connection to the, to the airspace uh, uh, controller will be a kind of solution? To the way I see it is if once an unmanned aircraft is truly integrated into the system, then to an air traffic controller, it looks just like any other aircraft. To do that, you'll have to have a transponder or ADSB, and you'll have to have the ability to talk to the air traffic controller in the same way a manned aircraft does. But uh, if it's a ground uh, uh, link, is a is a device, it means a, a telephone. Correct. Doesn't the ability to communicate between the pilot and the controller? shouldn't require a, a radio link in, in between. It, it just should require the ability for them to communicate. Now, it's a little more complicated than just a phone line because you also have to hear the other aircraft in that environment so you don't step on them when you're communicating. So it's, it's, it's a little complicated about how it's executed, but it's not beyond current technology in any way. And I'll, I'll add to that, we'll give it a little real world uh, experience in that we have to have, for our exemption, we have to have communication before, during, and not necessarily after, but before, during any film production that we do, we have to have direct communication with air traffic control. So I know the technology down the road will integrate a little bit more and give a little bit more um, uh, resilience, if you will, a little bit more depth, but we have to verbally communicate with ATC when we're, uh, when we're flying. Um, well, I guess the only other, oh, sure, we can actually do that. A question from the audience. Stephen Cass, I Triple E Spectrum Magazine. So I've heard here the, the 
the position has been put forward that small light UAVs are no more dangerous than a bird. Oh, thank you. A small light UAV is no da more dangerous than a bird or a, a rogue Wi-Fi signal. But I, my concern actually is with the future of small UAVs. When you get start getting into swarms of vehicles, when you have 30 or 40 very small UAVs coordinated, or when you have small UAVs that can very easily go into a house and may, or look at through a window and see somebody's putting in their alarm pin. So in the future, my concern is, is actually more at the small UAVs and how they might be abused than these very large systems where I know if a large drone is over my house. I don't know if a very small drone is peeking through my window or if 20 drones are bringing a package over my wall or 20 drones are coming to just run into my face because somebody doesn't like me. Uh, I think uh, the drone is like, uh, in this case, like uh, any uh, um, technical uh, device. I mean, uh, you can do a lot of uh, forbidden things with a car. But do you think there should be a limit on, say, the no a regulatory limit on, say, the number of drones that you can control in swarms? That you are, if your your software should only be able to allow you to control a fixed number of drones in a swarm? Um, I think uh, there is a uh, on the top of the of the regulation of the airspace. There is also a lot of other regulation of, of the usage of the drones, like uh, you have for, uh, for when you drive a car. Uh, so uh, concerning. Privacy, for example, uh, it's, it's very important. So the rules of uh, uh, the privacy in, uh, in, uh, in every country uh, exist. I don't know if there is a need for a new rule for, for privacy, but uh, um, so I think uh, there's plenty of regulation, and, and uh, a lot also are in the responsibility of the user. Like, uh, like when you use a car, uh, uh, you can use it very dangerously, or even a kitchen knife. Uh, Something. In terms of just part of a broader trend of, of uh, call the Internet of Things or whatever, is basically putting sensors and computation and connectivity out there in the world. Um, you know, I, I think what you're saying is, you know, should we limit the number of sensors that you can have in your car? Should we limit the number of sensors that you can have in your home? Should we limit the number of wearables that you can, that you, can you know, carry? I mean, uh, 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 we see the technology trends all around us here at CES. Uh, basically, these things are, being, are becoming smaller, cheaper, and more ubiquitous. And you know, call it swarms, or just call it you know, call it you know, nodes on, on the network. Um, technology wants there to be more of them. Um, it's easier for them. You know, if they get smaller, it's easier for them to be autonomous and, 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 and relatively harmless. Um, it'd be like you know, asking for a limit on swarms. Be like asking for a limit on like cores in your multi in your, in your processor chip. It doesn't seem. Well, to like I can't run ten cores into your face. Uh, <laughs> to, to be to be blunt, no. To be if you're at a public event. And I didn't like you, and I wanted to put 30 drones into your to attack you with 30 drones. That's different from throwing an i7 process. It just almost comes down to the definition of what is a drone. I mean, you know, we're just talking about sensors and, and computation with a battery. I mean, you know, so so if it does, if it has wings, that's one problem. If it has wheels, that's another. I mean, these are these are becomes a, become arbitrary distinctions. I think. She's going to get you up. I guess I'm, I'm concerned how we got in this situation to begin with. I heard a, a comment that's kind of chilling on the whole concept of innovation. And to summarize it was, you're used to innovating, but you're in our world now. Um, when I was a kid, I could make an SD's rocket and send a camera up without having to be an astronaut. I could sail an RC boat without being a skipper. I could fly a Cox airplane without being a pilot. It seemed like the once we used their term of drone, this took on a life of its own. At the end of the day, not only is it really just, an, I, I get military and commercial and 55 pound, I get that. But for most of it, for a parrot, it, it's an RC plane. It not only is it an RC plane, but I can stick four motors on a pizza box and fly something more stably than I could a cocked airplane. But yet now we have to debate, and I could fly my cocked airplane into somebody's face. And there was never a government committee that told me whether I could do that or not. By your definition of airspace, the Wright brothers couldn't have flown 10 feet off the ground to invent the airplane that pays your bill. Where did we get to this point where suddenly innovation has to stop before policy is made, as opposed to innovation continues and then policy comes in after the fact? Let me, let me correct something there. One, another provision in the law, uh, the FAA's 2012 law, was a carve out for uh, 
model aircraft. We do not regulate model aircraft other, other than from the standpoint of that, that if you take your model aircraft, and this was always true, this isn't something new. If you took your Cox aircraft and, and flew it near a manned aircraft, that, that would be a problem. That, that didn't change. Um, but other than that, we don't, you don't have to have any sort of license from the government to fly your model aircraft. That's, you know, it's fully allowed. There's a, there's a whole section. Then why is there a concern about flying his, his parrot in my backyard? Not from a regulatory standpoint. Jim, isn't it true that as long as they have options, the people will follow certain regulations, state local energy, satellite, the airspace, don't fly over crowds. As long as you fly and follow those basic regulations that they set up for, don't go where you fly. It, it just seems like this industry has stopped waiting for a response rather than continuing and getting guidance down the road. I think what the industry is waiting for a response for is, is how we're going to regulate the commercial versus side right? of unmanned aircraft. Yeah, I, I encourage you to walk around, um, you know, the North Hall a little bit. Uh, this industry is not stopped. Okay. And Carrier Mock would be a uh, spokesperson for that. They are in, a, in allowing the innovation. But the commercial side that Jim brought up is a whole different animal. If I, I forget the numbers, the estimates that if they blanket, if blanket approved, anybody use drones for commercial purposes tomorrow, it's in the tens of thousands. That's pretty dangerous. We have time for one, one more question. I think John would have had his hands in the box. Yes, Thanks, hey. So I represent an Asian dictatorship, and uh, we have low regulation in our country. We already bought uh, 1,100 Phantom II drones, and we love them. Can you tell me how I can use new type of drones for all my country to spy on our citizens and know more about them? Maybe aerial mob and then Anderson. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I think we can we can table that one for the time. <laughs> can, we, can we get uh, another volunteer? We have a question right here. Earlier, uh, Mr. Anderson brought up the uh, uh, how they've been working with the FCC with the with the 2.4 gig sandbox, um, and it seems to me that this is very similar to the way the FCC has dealt with ham radio licenses, uh, private licenses over the years, and public radio licenses. And I think you could save a huge amount of time and grief looking at that as a model as how tight the FCC was regulating a shared resource, the spectrum, and how it's loosened up over the years. And like, like with a ham radio license, if I can recognize a radio two out of three times, I can get a tech license and do some very limited things. By the time I get an extra class license, I can go overseas and operate a radio, or I can build my own radio equipment without having to get permission to do that. And one of the biggies that I can see here is um, when the FCC went from they had to certify every single piece of equipment to the fact that there's a set of rules and you can self-certify without having to submit it to a committee and it taking three months to get a new product out there. I'd really like to see something clear cut so I can build a, build a drone at home from a kit of known parts and not have to get some kind of regulatory approval for it. Yeah, the FAA actually already has examples of, of just that on the, on the manned aircraft side. There are special rules for home-built aircraft, uh, different set of rules for uh, what we call ultralight vehicles, uh, et cetera. So there, there already is a graduated uh, level of, of certification required based on the risk. And, you know, Wish we could talk about the rules so you could you could see, you could actually comment on what we come up with, but you know we, we plan to fit unmanned aircraft into that same risk-based approach that we have for, for manned aircraft, and so we look forward to your comments. When we're yeah, yeah. Like the concept of like graduated licensing, like right now you've got a private pilot license, the IFR uh, visual rule, or uh, and, and ultralights, you don't need a license at all. All right, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, it's, it's
wrap this up. But thank you all for coming. Thank you to the guests.